Let's do a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys ever think about the universe? This <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> I'm glad birthdays is this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> you are about to begin listening to an introduction for Bird Morath. Relax, concentrate, dispel your thoughts, let the cafe around you fade. <laughs> Bird is both nimble and elusive. Listen, I could have written a bajillion and a half introductions for tonight, but he said I only get four to seven minutes, so let's try to keep this one quick. <laughs> I've brought with me a 20-sided die and a list of 20 things. You can probably guess where this is going. <laughs> um, creatures of the audience, tonight this is time. It's a place. Let's roll. Let's take a chance. Let's, let's do this thing. <laughs> 18. Bird usually paints two shades of neon and only one on one of his hands, kind of like Michael Jackson, except with nail polish and not a sequins glove. Bird, I'm not making fun of you. I told myself I was not gonna do any more mockery with makeup, but I guess that's not the case. Just kidding, just kidding. I am entirely serious. I am just jealous of your style. <laughs> 20. But wait, look, over there, in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's, it's... <laughs> Where? M. Cole, when? November 13th, 2015. Who? Bird. What? A moment of silence. Why? In honor of the deceased. How? Reciting ODB's aliases from memory, which all of them? <laughs> 11. Last week, I had a dream where Bird demonstrated how to do this introduction. <laughs> it went nothing like this. And that is because Bird doesn't tell me what to do and also I don't know how to play the guitar. He really wanted me to play the guitar. <laughs> In the dream, Bird was holding a black Gibson, the same kind B.B. King used to play, as he stood alone on a mammoth stage, kind of like the Coors Event Center, except Innisfree. A grain of sugar slipped from the stairs steps. The only thing you need, Bird said, is a good pair of leather pants. <laughs> That was about my reaction. <laughs> oh, and then he did one of these. <laughs> it was more dramatic in my dream. <laughs> oh, also, silly dreams. Birds don't wear leather. <laughs> Seventeen. Fourth wall. <laughs> I love the deadpan silence. <laughs> anyway, Paul's <laughs> gone. Let's do a couple more. One time. 
made a conversation out of ceiling tiles. And I mean, literally, he was talking about the ceiling tiles. They weren't even cool. They were like those corporate gray rectangular ones, the kind that's pretty difficult to talk about for the most part and really ugly. <laughs> but listen, the conversation was pretty good for what it was. <laughs> Lucky 13. <laughs> Oh, this is a choose-your-own-adventure, and I think I will stop here, travelers of the night. Please join me in welcoming Bird, probably. Such a goddamn weirdo. <laughs> I mean that. I mean it in my heart. Just for you. You're very welcome. Uh, I had a lot of my introduction, it was based around, um, or what I was about to say, was partially based around saying that what you just said was too nice. But I, don't think, I don't think that really works anymore. So instead, like maybe you can just imagine that that was a different introduction than it was, even though it's exactly what I wanted it to be, and it exceeded all of my expectations. I still need you to imagine that it was something different. Um, because there are some people in life who uh, are too nice to you, they say things about you that are just a, just a little bit too sweet. And there are some people in life who just sort of stab you in the heart, just so. That was that. Um, and, I, and, I, and I appreciated it. I knew one other person like that. It's when I was in the second grade at PS11 in Woodside, Queens. Anybody from New York? <laughs> People love to cheer because they've been to a place or they lived there. Go to Colorado! Something, yeah, some kind of joke about drugs. Woo, skiing, whatever. I don't care. I, uh, I, I had a teacher in the second grade named Mrs. Petrograd. She was this stern Moscow transplant with a gray bun on top of her head the size of a cantaloupe. And she never said anything nice to me, and she didn't let me take the pet gerbil home from school, and she never gave me any extra grape juice, even if I complained about being pre-diabetic, which I wasn't, but somehow I got the idea that this could be a way to get more grape juice. Uh, she wasn't having any of that, but she was my hero. She was my hero in life, and I will tell you why. It was one day that I was sitting at recess on the steps, as usual, by myself. Oh, oh, bird, that's so sad. Yeah, it is sad, and you now have more empathy for me than you did before I said that. I was sitting on the steps by myself, and stupid Tony Del Vecchio decides that he wants to pick a fight with me. And in those days, the way that you pick a fight with somebody is that you create some kind of a disagreement about which is the best Ninja Turtle. Um, who, has, who has an opinion about which is the best Ninja Turtle? Yeah? Which is the best Ninja Turtle? Wrong! 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 See, I'm the man. And men do not mince words when they're expressing opinions about Ninja Turtles. Uh, you were right though, Donatello is the best one. I, I just wanted to be mean to you. Anyway, uh, so Tony Del Vecchio like, is being a real jerk and he's saying, Leonardo's the best, Leonardo's the best, Leonardo's the best. And I, like, I can't take it anymore, so I say, Leonardo's a dumb jock, Donatello does machines. And this like triggers a berserk button in Tony Del Vecchio's brain, and he he lifts both of his hands above his head as he surely saw The Undertaker do at WrestleMania the night before. But somehow, in this moment in which I am too terrified to run away, Mrs. Petrograd looks at me and goes, 
Yet. And she picks me up by the collar and lifts me above her head. And Tony Del Vecchio suplexes the concrete stairs, breaks his hand, and it was the best day of my goddamn life. <laughs> Ninja Turtles, it made me so happy. I felt though, I always felt after that moment that there was some chance that I owed Mrs. Petrograd really, really bad and that somehow, at some point, she was going to collect on her debt. Like, for instance, one day, a couple of months later, we were making English muffin pizzas. Who made the English muffin pizzas? When you're, yeah, everybody remembers. You just take the English muffin and you add the spaghetti sauce and you add the cheese and even a stupid baby can make it. So it's something good for second graders to do, to learn about the world. So I'm making English muffin pizzas, I'm throwing cheese all over the place, and she's just glaring at me. And the only reason I can imagine why is because she wants to lift me up by the collar again and throw me into the pizza oven. And at this point she's become the witch from Hansel and Gretel and she looks into the oven and she goes, I save your life once, boy. I can always take it back. She didn't murder me. She just like, she just said, Boy, too much cheese. So, it, was, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. But anyway, I, I still think about those days a lot. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, while I was thinking about doing this reading, um, I, uh, I actually called her. I looked her up to see if she was still at PS11. And she was, and when I managed to get on the phone with her, there was no, how are you doing? There was no, what you've been up to? There was only, Da, 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 da. I remember you. You are one who would always become scared when other children would bring pets to show and tell. And you would run to bathroom to wet your pets. And I said, like, that doesn't make a lot of sense because, number one, I love animals, and number two, why would I run to the bathroom to wet my pants? He goes, da da da, nyet 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 nyet, da 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 da. I remember you very well. You are one with medium potential. Very, very, very medium. And I said, wow, Mrs. Stalingrad, that's kind of uh, inventory. Medium, you really did think of me as a hamburger all along. <laughs> So, so there's some people in life that, uh, that, 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 that get you just right. Um, by the way, if I haven't mentioned it yet, this is an unusually attractive and well-dressed audience, and that makes me feel bad about myself. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna tell one story. It is called uh, Recipe for Banana Almond Cake. Elephant's in the third grade. He's a big kid. He's always been a big kid. I mean, he's been a big kid for an elephant, even. He can't ride in the normal school bus because the seats aren't big enough for him. They have to get a special cube van to travel him back and forth. Uh, when he's in class, he breaks the little third grade chairs under him. Elephant has been studying astronomy in school. He likes it. It's pretty good. They've got a space center nearby, and so the kids get to go look at the space shuttles, talk to the colonels there, that kind of thing. There's a girl. There's a girl that Elephant has had his eye on for a little while. She's Tina. She's El 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 Elephantina. Elephantina, we can call her. I, I isn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense that she's Elephantina and he's just Elephant. Like, shouldn't he have to be Elephant Teddy or Elephant Tiberius or something? But I don't want to say Elephant Tiberius 800 times tonight, so he's just Elephant. Um, he's had his eye on this girl for a while because she's got this way of moving through the undergrowth without trampling it under her feet. Not bad. Um, and so one day he goes up to her and he asks, uh, you know, our, um, our, our space, our, our, our space project, do you want to do it together? If you want, if you want, if you want, we could do it together. And she's like, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah, except um, like I'm moving. I'm totally, I'm totally moving away. So I, I don't know. And he says, oh, oh, yeah, um, yeah, well, maybe, maybe you're moving. Maybe I could just, like, you know, your, your phone number, and when you move, I could call you and tell you about space. And she says, yeah, yeah, I'm moving to another country, and I don't think they have phones. So, no, I don't think, I don't think that's going to work. And he says, yeah, 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 no phones. Yeah, it's, I tell you what, pen, you want to be pen pals? You want to be pen pals with me? Like, I can just write to you and tell you about space in another country. And she's like, yeah, you, you know what, I'm kind of moving to space, like I'm a part of a Martian colony, and we're going to go live on Mars. And it is not possible that uh, you could visit, or that you could call me, or that you could get a letter to Mars. Ever. Ever. Sorry. An elephant in this moment has been a fairly naive boy for most of his life, but he does realize in some part of his elephant brain that the payload of a space shuttle is very exact and there is literally no way that an elephant, let alone a family of elephants, is being ferried to Mars. He takes it like a champ though and he says, well, okay, bye. For the next 12 years, Elephant studies to become an astronaut. He takes a diet, he likes to go work out, he listens to Rocket Man by Elton John over and over in his headphones, and he goes to the space center, and he knows that they're not going to take him, but somehow he gets the confidence to do it anyway. And the colonel, who's got this flat top, takes one look at him and says, Son, you've got a lot of moxie to go to the space station. There's not a lot of boys with the grit to try out to be spacemen anymore. But I see those glasses on your face, and I regret to inform you that no man with less than 2020 can ever set foot in one of our space birds. He doesn't even mention how big elephant is. He doesn't even men he doesn't mention it. He doesn't mention it. Nice guy, I guess. Elephant doesn't get the job. Elephant gets a job at the lipstick factory, which sounds like a club for drag queen hipsters, but is a place where people make lipstick. Um, elephant's job is, uh, you know, like the little metal ring that's on the lipstick and it like separates it. He puts those on. He puts those on about 5,000 times a day. Um, and uh, it starts to get to him all of the lipstick fumes that are coming off of the machines. Plus, he's got big hands like frozen turkey carcasses, and so about one in ten lipstick tubes, he ends up exploding all over himself, and he gets Scarlet Sunset or Blood of Virgins or Hello Kitty Pink all over his body. He goes home to his apartment, and he looks at the floor, and he sees red clouds like bloody cotton candy. And sometimes it gets hard to tell whether it's a dream or it isn't a dream. The lipstick factory closes because it turns out that lipstick has become kind of a specialty item. Nowadays, most people just get the color tattooed to their lips. <laughs> The only people who really need to get lipstick and take it off at the end of the day are hookers and clowns. <laughs> Elephant gets a job as a clown. Be glad it wasn't hooker. Elephant gets a job. <laughs> Elephant gets a job as a clown. Sort of. He's working at the Chuck E. Cheese, which is like being a clown as a cartoon mascot. You know, like getting pieces of pizza and whole bottles of Coca-Cola thrown at his back, taking pictures with the kids, that kind of thing. Um, the only difference between him and the other people working at the Chuck E. Cheese is that elephant is an elephant. 
Uh, so everybody else gets to wear a costume, but for Elephant, it's just him. Elephant gets a job at the Korean grocery. Uh, you know, mopping the floors, making stacks of papayas, <coughs> sweeping the flies off of the red onions. There is always the same song playing, and he doesn't understand any of it except for the chorus where they go, baby, 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 baby. One day, he sees somebody in the Korean grocery who looks pretty good from behind, and he's in lust. This is his belusted now. His belusted turns around, picks up a red delicious, and says, Hey, how are these? Red delicious. He's in love. This is his beloved now. She says, Should I have the red delicious, or should I go for the, for the golden delicious? Over here. He says, Are you new to apples? And he's feeling pretty good about himself in this exact moment. <laughs> He says, yeah, yeah, the um, thing is, I've been allergic to apples for my whole life, pretty much, um, but I just got a shot from the doctor, so I can eat them now, and I want to make sure that the first apple is really good. So, red delicious or golden delicious, which one should I do? And he thinks really hard, because something tells him that this is a very important decision in this moment, and he says, you go with the golden delicious because the red delicious is bred for color at the expense of its flavor and texture. It is an ironic tragedy, the red delicious. Gold delicious, gold delicious is the one for you. Somehow she finds this charming and she laughs and she takes one bite of the golden delicious and it is like watching the sun being eaten. Baby, 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 baby. She starts to turn purple, like an eggplant. And he asks her, why are you turning purple? And she says, yeah, I, um, I lied about getting the shot. I am really, really allergic to apples. And there is no hospital within 50 miles of here, and there is no treatment, and there is no cure, so if it's okay, I'm just gonna go outside and finish my apple and enjoy the three minutes that I have left. <laughs> and he says, wow, that was, uh, that was really specific. <laughs> Elephant gets a job at the hyper business customer-oriented, paradigm-shifting law and computer solution center on the 30th floor. Elephant's knees aren't very good, and the elevator is not able to carry him, so it hurts. On the 30th floor, though, there is another elephant. We can call her Elephantessa. Elephantessa is a little bit sportier than Elephant was. Um, Elephantessa was a badminton champion. Uh, sometimes she's late for work because she likes to watch The Price is Right. And it turns out that the two of them share an interest in astronomy. And so they like to spend their lunch hours together going, uh, going to the local space center. Um, she lets it slip at one point that she has a birthday coming up. Uh, Elephant decides that the thing to do is to make her a birthday cake. And something tells him that this also may be a very important decision. Uh, I need you all to imagine with me. Imagine you believe that the better you can bake a birthday cake, the more anybody will love you. Or, more relevant, the more that one person in particular will love you. Say you don't have the best palate, and the stove doesn't hold the temperature very well, and it's summer, and the heat in your apartment makes you want to die. But, say you buy a picnic basket, an oven thermometer. Say the bananas you've been buying don't ripen at a reliable rate. So say that the difference between love and not love is in whether you buy a bunch of bananas every day for two weeks and you put some of them in paper bags with apples and some not so that when the time comes to bake you know you'll have a few that are 
perfect? Say you spend the day on your computer, checking how long it will take the cake before it loses moisture, whether you can keep it in plastic or the refrigerator, and the exact temperature when buttercream frosting starts to melt, because there is a difference between love and not love, and sometimes it may be slight enough to measure in minutes and Fahrenheit. Say you crack the almond shells one by one on your computer desk with your elephant foot trying not to get the detritus in your keyboard. Say you melt 70% cocoa solids, the slow way, the gentle way, letting it sit in a metal bowl above a simmering water, and then you spoon the syrup into a Ziploc bag and cut the corners of the Ziploc so now you can pipe words in chocolate onto wax paper, someone in particular's name. You do this 17 times because you want the letters perfect and the difference between love and not love may be measured in chocolate penmanship. Say you can't get the ratio of butter to sugar in your frosting quite right, and so you add more sugar and spit it, and you taste again, and you spit one spoon sugar, two spoons sugar, three and a half quarter spoons sugar, and it's never quite right, and you keep spitting it out, but you've been spending so long making this frosting that you haven't eaten in a week, and it may be that this has to be good enough. When her birthday comes, you put the cake in the picnic basket and you take 30 flights of stairs up, one step at a time, so that the frosting cannot smudge. You wait for her lunch break, bring her the cake, holding it in trembling fists, set it down on her desk, too frightened to speak. She takes a bite and you want to say the frosting, it isn't perfect, it's too much sugar, or it's not sugar, it's not exactly how you want it. Just Forgive me for this, please, 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 but instead you blurt out, it's because I love you. <laughs> and she says, she says, thanks. <laughs> gentle, 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 gentle. Be gentle with yourself right now. There's worse things than thanks, so. Enjoy this for what it's worth. The next time might not be as easy. Elephant is on the roof of his tenement building. There haven't been a lot of space flights recently, but there is one. There is going to be one last space flight before the space center is permanently retired. He is watching the shuttle begin to take off and the sound of it makes his ears flap in the wind. He notices that the angle of the space shuttle's approach is low, it is dangerously low, and it may just be that it is going to buzz the roof of his tenement building. So it gets close enough and he does the thing that it is impossible for an elephant to do. He jumps and he grabs the side of the space shuttle and it pitches dangerously to the side. And the astronauts inside go, there is some thing, there is some 18,000 pound thing on the wing of this space shuttle is going to crash and we are all going to die unless we eject. So they hit the eject and whoosh, elephant is alone. He is clinging to the edge. He is clinging so hard to the edge of the space shuttle and he gets to the door and he pounds it. One, he pounds it. Two, he pounds it. Three, and the door comes open. An elephant falls inside and the door slams shut behind him. Elephant looks outside and he realizes that it has become very black and the stars have become so strange. He doesn't recognize them anymore. But he thinks that in this moment, I would really like to see how it looks outside. So he goes back to the door and he hits it, and the cabin depressurizes, and all of the air is sucked out, an elephant along with it. He spins over and over himself, and with each revolution, he sees the space shuttle get further and further away. And he weighed nothing. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.
Another round of applause for Bert Morales. And, and Elise Parker. And have a great summer, everyone. See you later.